Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new board game series on the channel, Best of the Month. In this, a range of creators are going to get together to discuss their favourite game from the last month. Now, don't worry, this doesn't have to be the latest hotness, it's just whatever we have enjoyed most, got back to the table and stuff in the last month. So there should be something here for everyone. Now without further ado, I'll pass over to the first creator, Clara. Hello everyone and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here on this first episode of this new monthly show. Uh, you might recognise me from Dragon Collective and I also have my own channel where I do dioramas, mini painting and review board games and that's uh, under my name, Clara Barker. But today we're talking about games that we've really been enjoying the last month and I love that because it means I can talk about old games that I've just been really enjoying playing this month and today's game is an old one. It's from 2015 so it's a good few years old and it's a game that on paper I really shouldn't well I had no interest in playing the game is called the voyages of Marco Polo and it's a very sort of it, on the surface it's a very dry Mediterranean trading traveling around resource management game so it seems like a very sort of dry game but there's a few things about this game that just make it really special and I hadn't played it but I was invited to try it on board game arena where you can play it and it turns out it's wicked and I've not stopped playing it so on one hand you have a worker meeple, one worker, and what you do with that meeple is you travel around a map and you establish trading posts in different places and you get different resources by doing that and then hopefully you can fulfill contracts for points. But for a game that's all about traveling around the Mediterranean, it's actually really, really difficult to travel. So the main way you do that is by buying the travel action. How do you buy the travel action? Well, this is what's glorious about this so there's one worker meeple but actually the core of this game is a worker placement game but using dice so it's dice worker placement and I love that as a mechanic it's really great so at the start of the round everyone rolls their dice and then you have your values and you can use those dice to but to place them like workers in different areas to take actions but you know if you roll higher die values then and you, that's the one that you place and you'll get more resources so maybe you'll get more camels or if you put a lower number you'll get less but you need to manage where you're putting them maybe you don't need so much gold maybe you don't need so much travel and I love worker placement games it turns out it's actually the same designers as Tolkien the Mayan calendar which is one of my favorite worker placement games so I'm not surprised that I actually really enjoy this game I just didn't know that at the time a couple of nice things about this game though, if someone has already taken one of the basic actions and you want to use it, you can still go there, you've just got to pay extra gold to do it. Also, each player has a really super powerful action and so it's a really powerful, uh, you know, special ability but everyone's got one. So yeah, it's it's really good fun trying those different special abilities and I've been doing that a lot this last month. I will say there's a slightly updated version in the Voyages of Marco Polo 2. I've just started playing it sort of the same and sort of different. But yeah, it's really good fun. So hopefully I'll see you soon. Maybe I'll see you on my channel. Until next time, take care and bye-bye. Hi, I'm Barb, Meeple PhD. And my favorite game this month has got to be Paleo. Designed by Peter Rustemeyer, art by Dominic Mayer, and published by Hansom Gluck. Paleo is a cooperative, card-driven exploration game where everyone is working together to uh, keep our people alive long enough in order to complete a mammoth painting which will unite our tribe. Each player is controlling a group of Stone Age humans who are, um, on each turn, simultaneously choosing locations to go to and try and get food for you, for the tribe for the day or materials so that you can craft things to make life a little bit easier but also ultimately finding all the danger because there is so much danger in the stone age each time you get through the location deck you enter what's called a night phase where you have to feed all your people and you have to complete a few goals based on the scenarios that you're playing fail any of these and you get skulls uh, the game finishes if you lose by getting five skulls or immediately if you are able to complete that mammoth painting. So I love the puzzle of this game. Uh, each turn all of the locations are revealed and you talk about which locations you should try and resolve. You know, maybe it's the food because those can get you a lot of skulls at the end of the, the day if you can't feed everybody. 
Or maybe you wanna get some materials because that's gonna help you get food on the next round if possible. Uh, or maybe you don't have a choice because you turned over a danger card and you have to deal with it. So a big part of wanting to come back to this game again and again is because it comes with 10 mini modules that you can mix and match to make the game easier or harder and explore new things. So right now, I haven't actually gotten through all 10 decks and that's why I want to get it to the table tonight to see what's in the next deck we haven't explored yet. Now, I will say that there is some luck in the game. Um, there's the luck of the, the card shuffles, and in some scenarios, there is luck from dice rolls. I personally don't feel like the game is all about luck. My evidence for this is that we often will play through a new scenario and lose spectacularly, and then we'll play immediately again, because uh, we have to, and the second time through, we usually pull out a win. And what that tells me is that we've learned something by our first playthrough and are applying new strategies in our second playthrough. And every game of Paleo we've played has felt like we are on the hairy edge of losing. I love that in cooperative games. I want a co-op game where I feel like I could lose, but I know there's a chance of winning. So if this game sounds at all interesting to you, you might wanna check out Paleo and maybe it'll end up on your favorite game list one month. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter as at MeeplePhD and I have a blog at MeeplePhD.com. We'll see you next month. Hey there folks, this is Brandon with All Aboard Gamer. And today I'm giving you a quick summary review of a game we just reviewed on our channel, gave it the full treatment. It's a Wonderful World by Lucky Duck Games. Lexi and I gave it the full press, and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. This is a game that we discovered has a lot of depth, and there's more to it than meets the eye, like a transformer, if you will. So in this game, you're gonna be drafting cards, uh, obtaining resources, constructing development cards to put in your empire, and those empire cards trigger different things during production phases and then generate points at the end of the game. It's very, very quick playing, very easy to play, but the strategy is very deep and it's very tense because it it gives you enough time four rounds almost doesn't seem like enough time to do everything you might want to do but it gives you just enough time to put something good together if you're paying attention and so it just provides all of that thinkiness but in an easy to play package and a really pretty package now we gave it the full six point gamers review that we typically do on our channel gameplay aesthetics mechanisms ease of play replayability and strategy gamers uh, four of those six categories, we scored a pretty strong positive. Um, in aesthetics and mechanisms, because we don't have a theme, a separate theme category in the gamers uh, acronym, we weave theme into some of these categories because theme is important to us. There's not much here. Okay, there's good artwork, uh, very, very nice. It gives you sort of this dystopian kind of idea, but there's really no lore, there's really no there's really no clever thing of what you're doing or any information about the different empires that you're playing. But uh, it is quite a good game. And if you're looking for a f easy to learn, easy to teach, fast playing, but very strategic, very deeper than you might think it is, uh, card game, then look no further than It's a Wonderful World. There's expansions for it as well. So that's going to do it for this quick little review. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you uh, want to check out more of our content, we are All Aboard Gamer on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. So thank you very much for coming. All Aboard. See ya. Hey everyone, I'm Nick. I'm Vic. And we're Envy Board Gaming. So for this month, our favorite game that we've played that is new to us is one we don't actually own. We played it with some friends uh, at another channel, Legends of Nirvana. They own the game. It is out of it's out of print, I believe. You can't really get a hold of it. You get a hold of it second hand. It's Coloma. We both agree this one was our favorite for this month. Coloma is super good. What I like about it is the action selection. So you're putting out your your basically you have hidden information of what you what action you're gonna select on this on this uh, action selection board. So it's all numbered, and you're picking that number, and your opponents are doing the same thing. If you match, you get the lesser of the, you're both gonna get the lesser of the actions. If you don't match, you're gonna get two of those actions, two types of actions. And we always matched. Eh, almost. <laughs> At first, it was all friendly. With three, yeah, we were always matching. It was fun, though. Nah, 
guess. I don't know. I didn't feel like we were always matching. No, but I heard that Randy said that Randy, a yeah. lot of times when he was playing, uh, they were matching a lot. But yeah. anyway, it doesn't matter. So I the action selection was super good. The components were really good. Nice uh, theme, everything. I liked it a lot. I thought it was really good a game. What did you like about it? Yeah. I mean, I loved all of the ways that you have to think about where you're going, how you're going to execute it. I liked being able to sneak in at the end with the bandits fighting them. And then suddenly I was able to deploy the personnel I needed to, to win it. And uh, just while we were playing it, it doesn't happen often because he's the primary real buyer of the collection. I was looking at how am I going to get this? How am I going to buy this for us? Uh, and then I, of course, saw that it was all uh, inflated prices that are aftermarket. So I'm not ready to I'll have to wait for the reprint for that. Hopefully that happens. Yeah, I just really liked how quick the turns are, too. It doesn't take long. And the game overall didn't overstay its welcome. So it was just altogether a lot of fun. Ah, great game. Yeah, we loved it. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. In Brew, players are villagers in a woodland realm full of magical creatures, where all the seasons happen at the same time, and you're tasked with brewing magical potions to bring normality back to this woodland realm. It's all a bit odd. I'm Adam Porter and I run a YouTube channel called Adam in Wales where I do lots of reviews and top tens but I have a real focus on board game design. I first saw photographs of Brew on Instagram and I was immediately drawn in by the fantastic artwork and the beautiful dice. To be honest, the theme doesn't really come through when you're playing the game, but it's a really nice world to kind of inhabit and occupy for an hour or so of your life because of the gorgeous appearance of the game. Throughout the game, you place dice onto matching symbols, either in the forest or in the village. And when you place in the forest, it allows you to forage for ingredients or to train a creature. And trained creatures give you permanent abilities. And when you've gathered enough ingredients, you can brew a potion, which gives you a one-off ability that you can use later in the game. When you place at the village, then you take an associated action and the available actions change between rounds as the day turns into night. And at the end of each round, you then claim a forest if you had more dice on it than any other player. And after four rounds, the game ends. And you score points for claimed forests, for trained creatures with a bonus if they're released into a matching colored forest, potions that you've brewed, and for leftover ingredients. Each turn presents you with many options for where to place your dice. And this can slow the game down a little bit because there are loads of locations here in the forest, in the village, or even placing dice onto one of your own cards. Even a really fast thinker is gonna take some time to decide what's the most desirable space to put your dice on. The dice are rarely rolled, which is great news if you're looking at the dice and thinking this is gonna be a really random affair, but it might be bad news for you if what you're looking for is a chaotic, fun dice roller. This isn't it. And the package is really affordable, which I really appreciate. The tokens are cardboard, and the dice are not the weightiest that I've ever felt, but they're very functional, and the artwork and price point more than makes up for any shortcomings. I really enjoyed Brew. I think Steve-O Torres did a great job with his design. And if you'd like to see more from me, head on over to my YouTube channel, Adam in Wales, and I'll see you there. So in the last month, I've managed to play a lot of games, but not many a lot of times, which is normally how I'd sort of say, if I've got a game to the table a lot and really enjoyed it, then that's probably my best game of the month. But I have to admit, the one that I was really wowed by and really enjoyed was Ticket to Ride Europe 15th Anniversary Edition. Now, if you're just getting into the hobby, I probably wouldn't even recommend you this version because it's, it's basically double the price of Ticket to Ride Europe. But Ticket to Ride Europe or this lovely fancy anniversary edition are great for just getting a game to the table of an evening after work. It's got the brilliant, easy to learn card play where you're on your turn, you're either drawing cards, trying to play a set of cards to claim a route on the board, and trying to sort of link certain destinations across, in this case, Europe uh, across the board. Now, with this version, do you need a bigger board? No. Do you need a board that's brightly coloured, vivid coloured, with extra details compared to the original? No. 
Do you need the carriages that aren't just the same model in different colours? They're different things like logs or transporting old style cars or uh, wheels of wire. No. Does that all add up to take what's a standard good production of Ticket to Ride Europe to the next level? Well, yeah, it kind of does. I am so glad I kind of caved in and got Ticket to Ride Europe 15th anniversary edition because it looks glorious when it hits the table and it will hit the table time and time again. And that's why it's my best of the month for this month. Hello there wonderful humans, my name is Anthony and I'm here to talk to you about my favorite game of last month, August, and that is a new game to me called Peep Mots, which is a little card game, uh, believe it me, yes, little songbirds in German, just cards. Basically the way you set this game up is you're going to have one of these bird feeders, either um, depending on which side, how many players you have, and you'll have some bird cards that are going to be eating at each side of this feeder with different values on them. So when it's your turn, you're going to play one of the bird cards from your hand to one of the lines of birds that are waiting to get to the feeder. You're then going to compare the total value of all the birds in the line to the current bird that's up at the feeder. If that total is now greater, you're going to take one of these sort of seed prize cards here based on the difference. So, for example, if you played a card down and it made the total 10, and the current bird value up there was six, the difference is four, you're going to take the fourth one from the top, or from the bottom, I should say. And that might happen multiple times, so you can potentially get more than one card on your turn if the value is greater still, because what happens is after you play that card, you're gonna take that bird away from the feeder, he goes into your collection, which is gonna get you points later on at the end of the game, and then a new bird is gonna come up to the feeder. So this could lead to another example of your value, your total value rather, still being higher than that new bird, in which case you would then take another card. If you play a card and the value is less than the current bird at the feeder, you simply get to play one of the birds from your hand, as long as it's equal or lesser value than what you just played in front of you. So you're gonna get points from collecting these seed cards that are worth various amounts, and then also at the end of the game, you're going to get points for having the most of a certain species of bird, which are associated by color, and then points for matches of birds. If you happen to have a male and female of the same species, you'll get points that way as well. But there are some negative points in this game, or negative uh, effects, I should say. Some of the cards from this feeder deck are not seeds, but they are some, some pesky other animals that tend to mess up the bird's feeding frenzy here. We can have the crow that's going to scare away some birds, and the squirrel's going to steal some of the nuts from you. So in that aspect, as a person who's a fan of birds and has a feeder in his backyard, it's very true to life. <laughs> I'll say that. The squirrels are really, really annoying. I really enjoyed this game last month, and it got played a whole bunch of times. That's my favorite. If you guys are interested in checking out more stuff, check out Board Game Dads on YouTube and also BoardGameDads.com. Thanks to Oliver for having me on, and I really appreciate um, getting a chance to plug a little bit and I'm uh, looking forward to meeting um, all the other creators here on this video and hopefully follow some new folks and get some new followers myself. Thanks everyone and we'll see you next month. Hi everyone, my name is Clayton. I run Just a Geeky Dad YouTube channel. I cover a bunch of geeky topics like board games, TV shows, movies. What's best this month I would have to say is Chai. My wife and I play this all the time. I recommend if you can get it, the Hai Chi expansion. I feel it best plays at three to four players. If you enjoy T games, it's a must have expansion for Chai. Thanks for having me, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Take care. Hey, I'm Dieter Loosemore of Winsome Loosemore, and this month has been kind of the first month that I've been able to play quite a few games with, with people in real life again. Um, so I've had to, I to struggle to choose which one is, is the top one this month, and so I've gone by a number of plays only, really. Um, and had fun with, obviously, Red Rising from Stonemaier Games, uh, designed by Jamie Stegmaier and Alexander Schmidt, um, based on a book series, and I was, I've was i never read the book series, uh, and have very kindly been, been gifted by, uh, gifted the first book by somebody out there um, who connected with me, they're just so, so grateful, thank you. Um, Red Rising is a card game. Um, if you watch any of my stuff you'll see that I'm very much into card games and midweight euro games and this has 
This is a card game for sure, but has elements of that Euro uh, going up tracks, collecting resources to trigger end game things. Um, and so it just, it just adds that extra layer for me. Now I am a fan of Fantasy Realms, which is the game that Red Rising is very openly uh, based upon, which is about picking and putting up cards to, to build a hand, a combination of cards at the end that you're gonna score. Red Rising does exactly the same thing. Um, and instead of kind of all the discarded cards being available to you, it has very clear locations on the board as to where you can place and then you pick up from somewhere else, you trigger the power of the card that you lay, if it has one that you want to trigger, and you trigger the ability of the location that you pick up from, again, if you can, if you want to. And this is to go up the fleet track or collect helium or add influence into the Institute uh, or gain first player and trigger your own special power. Everybody has, has a, a minor asymmetric power at the beginning of the game. And I get the detractors um, from Red Rising. I get that there's a lot of suits, there's a lot of cards. Getting that one combo that's gonna, gonna fix everything is gonna be really tricky, but I'm okay with that. I love that. I love playing with lots of different people. It's a really simple one to teach some of these concepts to um, the production. Yes, if you don't want a particular insert, the, the standard edition is probably better value given that the colors and things are a bit off in collectors. I really like the, the quality. I love the feel of the materials though. Um, so for me, uh, it's a wonderful product. I, I'm generally a bit of a Stonemaier fanboy, that's okay. This might be slightly biased, but I'm okay with that. Uh, so Red Rising has been my game for this month. Thank you very much. Uh, do consider finding Win Some Loose More, check out. And if you want to follow, like, share, subscribe, or do, the, do that stuff, it'd be great to hear from you. I've been Dita. Thank you. Bye. Hey there, I'm Lance. I'm Sam. And we are Love to Hate. And on our channel, we're all about helping gamers find great games to play with. Non-gamers. That's right. So if you're somebody out there who struggles to find those games, those family gateway type games that work real well with people who don't typically play board games, then we're your channel. In this video, we're going to share with you the best games that we've played in the last month. Sam, you want to share yours first? Sure. My game um, is On the Rocks by 25th Century Game. It's a drafting order fulfillment game. Um, it's very unique with the marbles and, and how you're, you're going to get them and making the drinks. And it's pretty intuitive as well. I think it's a great game for a non-gamer because it is pretty simple to understand, mm -hmm. but it really introduces you to some of those um, game ideas such as drafting and order fulfillment. So it's, it's a great game and I had a lot of fun playing it. Yeah, very much so. And for me, the best game that I've played in the last month is The Initiative from Unexpected Games. In fact, this has been one of the best games I've played all year. It's a great game. Absolutely <laughs> loved this game. We did a review on it uh, probably three or four months ago now. Maybe not that long, I'm not sure. But uh, we are still playing this one yeah. and still getting it to the table. In fact, they just put out new free content on their website. If you've already played through the, the main missions in this one, you can go and check out that downloadable content and keep playing this game. It's so cool. If you love escape room games, you're going to like this one. So uh, those are the best games that we've played in the last month. And again, real quick, we're all about helping those people out there who just don't really have a good idea of how to play games, maybe with people who don't typically play a whole lot of board games. We're all about having fun and maintaining good relationships with people who don't typically get to the board game table all that often. So uh, I'm Lance. I'm Sam. And we are Love to Hate, and we'd love to have you come check us out on our channel. Hi, this is Griffin from Never Board of Gaming on Instagram, and my favorite board game of the month has to be Role Player. Role Player is a dice drafting, dice placement game by Thunderworks Games, and let me tell you, it's amazing. I fell in love with this game over a year ago and finally got a copy for myself. Uh, this month we played it probably five or six times, and it might be in my top 10 of all time. It takes some of my like favorite mechanisms from Sagrada, but mixes it with like an amazing theme from D&D. So all in all, it makes somewhat of an abstract concept feel really grounded in its mechanisms. What you're doing in this game is you're making a D&D character. So you're leveling up your strength, you're leveling up your dexterity, and you're trying to make sure your abilities match your character. 
So everybody has a unique character board. Um, I think the last game I was the Frogkin, which is this like frog creature. And I was also like chaotic neutral, all that stuff. I had to make sure that I was strong enough um, and had enough dexterity to match and get victory points, um, but while also checking my morals. So um, taking cards that were like not too good, but not too bad. <laughs> so this is a really cool game. It takes those mechanisms and just adds an amazing theme that ties it all in together. I'm probably going to pick up the expansion for this, and I see this one hitting the table a lot in the coming years. So if you like that type of thing, highly recommend this one. Thunderworks Games has been great for us. We also love cartographers. So if you like rolling rights, check that out too. Um, but yeah, role player. That's my best of the month. Have a good one, everyone. Game of the month is a really hard thing for me to judge. I worry if I pick one game I really like, my other games will get jealous. But the one game I've played that's wanted me going back for more of late is Hadrian's Wall from Garp Hill and Renegade Games. Hadrian's Wall is a Euro-style worker placement flip and fill game, though it's not actually any of those things. Your player board consists of two sheets. At the start of the turn, a card is turned from the main deck and you'll gain these workers to use for the turn. From your personal deck, you'll draw two cards, choose one that will score you at the end of the game, put that there and take the resources from your other card. You'll use your workers to cross off on your player board. This half of the board is your wall, your protection and your statistics. There's also an area here that will allow you to gain extra resources at the start of each turn. The other half of the board features your citizens, traders, performers, priests, apparitors and patricians and each of these has a series of buildings attached that thematically work. So the traders will give you access to marketplaces, the performers to theatres, the priests to temple and so on. All your citizens cost one yellow to mark off so if I were to use a yellow worker cross off here on the traders I'd gain a purple worker. So the game cascades and builds up as you go. At the end of each round there is an attack on the wall. Depending on the round and depending on the difficulty level of the game will depend on how many cards you turn over. So in the first round on the easy setting we'll turn over one card and we'll need to have one crossed off on the centre cohorts to beat them. If we beat them we get Valor if we don't, we get disdain. Very simply put, that's Hadrian's Wall. It has a very similar feel to Paladins of the West Kingdom. So if you like that, check this out as well. Hi everyone, my name is Bonzinator. My favorite board game of the month is The Lost Ruins of Arnak. I played it twice this month, once at four player and once again at two player. This game is highly rated on BGG around 8.1, its difficulty level is 2.85, it was designed by Elwyn and Min, and produced by Czech Games Edition. This game is all about discovering a new land, Arnak. You're, you're trying to find traces of the civilization by exploring the island, digging up artifacts, facing fearsome guardians, and going up the research track to discover the island's secrets. Along with digging and exploring and researching, you also need to overcome the Guardians, which are a lot of victory points by the end of the game. they are five victory points each for every Guardian that you defeat. Another way that you can score a lot of points in the game is the research track, and you're going to spend money or gems or rubies, and you're going to go up the track to the very top where you can then find more tablets, which have a ton of victory points. I think it's 11, 6, and 3. When I played the two player game, it was almost like we were doing two completely separate games from each other. When I played the four player game, it was very, very difficult to plan ahead because every single time that you needed a resource, someone ended up taking it. One thing that I didn't like with the game was actually the quality of everything. I feel like for the price that it's listed for, it should be better quality. And I'm only comparing it to other board games of the same price 
that are better quality. For example, I think that the box is really flimsy. I, I've had better boxes for the same size and the same price of a game. Another thing I noticed was the bags that came with it are super cheap. I, I love higher quality bags if I'm not gonna buy an insert. One other thing is the index cards, they are very, very flimsy. And also the instruction booklet, I was turning the page and since the booklet is larger, I was turning the page and it caught and I ripped the booklet on my first play. And that was really sad. That is me being picky about a game that I really enjoy though. One thing that I do like about this game as well is that there's a solo option. And since I do stream on Twitch, you can find me at twitch.tv forward slash bonzinator. You can actually see me play this game solo. I like buying board games that have the solo option now. I never really cared about it before, but now I'm really grateful for that option. Altogether, I was really surprised by this game. I heard it compares to Dune. I have not played Dune. I heard it came out around the same time and people like Dune more. Uh, however, I really enjoyed it and I'm so glad I was able to nab this one back in July. And I'm so glad I finally got it to a table this month twice. And I look forward to playing it again. Hey, I'm Jordan with Jordan Plays Blue. Uh, thanks, Oliver, for inviting me to do a Best of the Month. So I'm going to do these. And so my Best of the Month for... What month is this? This is August 2021. My Best of the Month is So Clover. This is a party game in sort of the vein of uh, Just One or Codenames. And so it's a kind of a word, uh, word association kind of party game. You're gonna have these four leaf clover boards. They are dry erase and you're going to, they have these little pegs on them and you put these cards in on the pegs and all the cards have different words on each side of them. And you're gonna put them in a square on the cards and each side of the clover is gonna create a pair of words and you have to write a word, uh, dry erase, write a word on the clover that links those two words. And then you're gonna do that for all four sides and then you're gonna remove the cards. You shuffle up the cards, uh, add a card, put them out on the table, and then everybody cooperatively has to try to figure out where the cards go based off of the clues that you put around it. It's one of those games where, like, you, you, like, I just, that I would teach it the same way, just like that. That's all the rules. And so you're kind of like, how would that work? And then you play it once, you're like, oh my gosh, this kind of does work. And, but adding that extra card in there kind of throws some people off because what if one of the words, Meets, matches one of the clues better um, but it's really great you have a you know you have a kind of a gimme you have like one wrong guess and then it, they'll uh, remove a couple things to let you know that those were the wrong cards and you have to rearrange them but generally see, speaking soul clover is really it's really clever and I think that's the pun here obviously but I really enjoy it and I think if you're fans of code names or just one or kind of bigger kind of word association party games this one is really good and I really enjoy it. So that's So Clover, my best of the month. I'm Jordan, thanks. My pick for board game of the month is Betrayal in the House of the Hill. In this game, we see the players take the roles of a colorful cast of characters as they explore around a haunted mansion. As you all explore around, you are literally discovering this mansion. It starts off with nothing, but as you go from room to room, you are drawing from a deck and playing it onto the board. This is the unique aspect of this game, as the first time you play this game, the mansion will be one way, but the next time it'll be entirely different. The other amazing aspect of this game is it starts off as a co-op game. Everyone is exploring around, everyone is trying to find items, or to get stronger, or hopefully not get weaker. But eventually, a turn happens. At some point, someone is selected to become the bad guy. And it's there when the game goes crazy. As we now see the game go from this cooperative game to a 1v whoever is left. This is a unique aspect of it that, once again, it adds to that variety. Every time you play this game, it will be different. There's going to be different items acquired. There's going to be different buffs or debuffs you may get. And very, very importantly is the fact that there is so many different scenarios written up for this game. And these scenarios are not just simple, oh, the one bad guy now has to kill all the good guys. No, there could be a lot more intricacy to it. There could be the villain needs to move to a certain part of the mansion 
oh, the heroes need to go and collect pieces all around and bring them to one specific spot. The villain could be weak, but there is a wandering monster now that is aiming to kill the party. The house is now changing and now you have to figure out where the heck you are going to go. There are so many different scenarios, 50 scenarios in total, and that is just the base game. There is also an expansion to that and there is the separate game, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate. I promise you if you're looking for a fun board game that has a bit of co-op and asymmetrical gameplay, then Betrayal in the House of the Hill will be a fun time every time you sit down. I guarantee it. Hey everyone, this is Rothekos. I'm very happy to be part of this project. This way I have one more reason to talk about board games, and I do love speaking with you about board games. My highlight this month is a fairly new game that I played for the first time. But first, let me show you how many different games I played this month. I played most of them for the first time, though not all of them. So, my favorite game of this month has some serious competition. The games I played this month you can see on screen right now, and there were some really good games, such as Taverns of Tiefenthal, The Lost Ruins of Arnak, Underwater Cities, Isle of Cats, Aeon's End, Dale of Merchants, Lands of Galza, and Takenoku. My game of the month that I totally love and I can't wait to add to my collection next year is Lands of Galza. The game was being funded in GameFound, it not only reached its funding goal but hit a lot of stretch goals that broadened the experience even more. Lands of Galza is an adventure game where you explore, experience and leave your mark on a persistent and open game world. You could compare this game to other narrative driven story games such as Sleeping Gods, but Lands of Gaza is definitely a very unique experience in its own right. If you want to see my full preview you can do so on my channel, but I'll highlight the aspects I like the most right here. First of all, the theme and artwork are just gorgeous, just like in the other games of Snow Lady Design, Dale of Merchants and Dawn of Peacemakers. Also the components are great, the cards have a really good quality and the same also applies to everything else, the character boards, the tokens as well as the dice. The game is incredibly creative in its approach. Not only is there a lot of detailed and interesting quests you can partake in, making each game a completely unique experience, also the game mechanics are done really well. Especially the skill system with the different dice really displays the skills of your chosen character. Exchanging the regular dice with your specialized skill dice is a genius concept. As a fan of story based board games, I can't wait to get the final version into my hands. If this game has piqued your interest, I definitely recommend checking out the preview on my channel and of course all other previews you can find on YouTube and the rest of the internet. Also, last month I played the game live with the developer, so if you head over to the YouTube channel of Snow Lady Design, you can watch me even play the video live. Well, I hope you enjoyed my part of this video. It's probably obvious how much I love board games, and if you love them just as much, why don't you drop by my channel? We both might have quite a lot in common we can share. Alright, that's all from me. Maybe I'll see you on my channel. Take care. Cheers! Hi everyone, it's Stella from Maple University. So I've been asked by Oliver to do best of the month. Now there are a few games that are really good, but I'm going to try to do one that is not Kickstarter because we, we do play a lot of Kickstarter games. Um, and this one also stands out. So Ariantes, um, which is going to be out soon uh, in a couple of months. And it is an abstract game about magical school. Now, what's so good about it, I'm going to get straight to the point, is the interaction. In a two-player game, it's not really a chess, but it feels like a, a chess game where you need, it's like a put, a tug of war where you need to area control certain things. And the juicy decision is whether you need to put a certain two tokens, colors or students uh, to put on the board or you put it on your area to control the professor. So this is a little bit more complex, I think, to explain, but um, this so good decision of uh, this game. It's very, it's highly, highly interactive. It plays well with even four players because it's a team of two. Um, and I don't know, it might be even um, game of the year, but we'll see. I mean, it, the year is not, it's not over yet. It is a, a very, very good area control, very interact, uh, really high interaction uh, where you put, you know, there's uh, like two parts of it. The first time is playing cards to determine turn order and move certain things around the board. And the second part is area control. Um, because I don't want to take a lot of time, so um, I'm sure you will Google Ariantis, so Google that. Um, yeah, so best game of the month is Ariantis. Hey everyone, I'm Allison. I'm Bryce. And, and we're, we're Better Half Reviews. And thanks to Ollie for inviting us to join on this cool little collab video. Uh, we've been playing lots of different games, so let's just dive into that. So one game that I've been really enjoying lately that's coming to retail really soon is Kim Joy's Magic Bakery. It's a super cute looking game. 
and it's a co-op like game with cards and you're trying to like make yummy recipes with adorable little critters and feed them all the things just in time to earn enough stars. So I've, I've really been liking this and it's lots of fun. One game we picked up not too long ago was Micro Macro. I've been enjoying this. Think, where's Waldo with a little bit of a story? And crime. <laughs> well, and crime, yeah. <laughs> um, but you, you look at this huge map with all these intricate little drawings. You try to find the story of the crime you're trying to solve. And it's a really interesting little game. And where you can find us on social media, we have YouTube and also Instagram and a little bit on Facebook. It's Better Half Reviews for each of those. On YouTube, we post reviews, previews, top 10 lists, uh, collab videos, whatever comes to mind. Instagram, we post more daily with games that we're playing or testing out and other fun, silly things. So yeah, be sure to follow us. We do a lot of great stuff. And we're pretty silly, so. That's what happens when you you do you play games with your better half, right? So we say that we're each other's better halves. Um, that's what I usually go with, but Bry sometimes says other things. Look, I had to choose the username, and the lesser half was the only thing available. That's not the only thing available. <laughs> that's just what he says. But no, we're each other's better halves, because that's the question we get asked a lot. Like, who's the better half? It's like we're each other's better halves. You know, make it silly. But anyway, so thanks for watching us be ridiculous. Hopefully we'll see you on YouTube or Instagram. Bye. Happy gaming. That's my life. Have fun. Happy gaming. So I'm Desiree, and uh, I grew up in uh, Burkina Faso. For part of my childhood, I spent in Burkina Faso. And the Sahara is one of these areas where many, many different things meet. Wow, just like the lines in the game, the roots meet. Yeah, exactly. I'm uh, looking forward to playing it. It's like the, the route this Targi is taking through the desert. I didn't think of it that way. Tuareg historically like used to guide caravans of traders through the desert to get to a point where they can trade their goods. The people to go to when you want to cross <laughs> the desert. So that's why I thought maybe that's why it's like a whole li a line in Targi. Okay, uh -huh. what is a victory point? Do you know those silver crosses? Can you see them? Like yeah, they're on yeah. your cards. Those are points. Those are victory points. So you know these uh, crosses? Yeah. Um, like the Tanarilt, they're called. Okay. I can't believe you've got a real um, silver cross like on the game. That's amazing, yeah. and you're holding it in your hand. So there is no gold in the middle. I wanted to get some gold. I'm telling you, it's really rare. This is what I'm telling you. If you go to the trader, though, you could like get all that salt yeah. into gold. So this empire was really rich in gold, but what they lacked was salt, which came from the north, okay. and which traveled or was transported through the Tuareg area. Salt as a commodity was traded with gold. Well, there are people who play it like, like these are people all over the world playing it. And now you've played it. Now you know what you, you got to do. I will become world champion. <laughs> Hey, I'm Grant with Grant's Game Rex, and my favorite game I've been playing over the last month is the new game Brew from Pandasaurus Games. This game has some of the most gorgeous custom dice I have ever seen, and I am legitimately obsessed with them. You guys are the prettiest thing I ever did see. Oh, you would never leave me, right? Right? Brew is a dice placement area control game, and the dice placement is nice. You can get some resources that allows you to buy some potion cards that'll help you mitigate dice rolls in the future, but the area control is where this game really shines. That's what sets this game apart from other games, and it's where you're going to score most of your points, honestly. And I love the area control aspect of this game because it's really thinky and really brutal oh boy is it brutal you are gonna be screwing over everybody all of the time but that's what makes it okay it's not personal 
You're never screwing over Gary. You're screwing over Gary and Lauren and Terry and anybody who plays. I'm screwing you all over and you're screwing me over. And that's what makes this game fun because it just... The momentum and the pendulum swings back and forth all the time. You're messing with him and he's messing with her and she's messing with me and we're all messing! <laughs> so if you don't mind some take that and you're looking for a thinky and gorgeous area control game, check out Brew. I'm Grant with Grant's Game Rex. You can find me on YouTube at Grant Lion. I put up a short and silly recommendation videos for good games every week. Uh, and you can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at Grant's Game Rex. Thanks everybody. Happy to be here. Hi everybody. I am Richard from Genders Gaming and I wanted to share with you what I think could be the game of the year. I know this is big words, but this game is quite awesome it's not released yet it will go out on kickstarter in september i'm talking about beast from studio midhall down in malmo sweden this is a one versus many type of game the story here is that you have a land that has been untouched by humans for many many centuries but now the settlers has arrived the beast has woken from its silent sleep and are now ready to protect its land. The hunters need to work together in kind of co-op to figure out where the beast is because the hunters never know the beast's actual location when it's moving. They only know its last known location. And the only way the hunters really can figure out where the beast are is to work together and search that location. During the game, you will have different kind of achievements that you need to reach to be able to upgrade your either your beast or your hunters to be able to do more damage. The beast can also use summons to attack or change the environment even. And this is a really, really cool game. It's quite different. I really like the mechanics in this game. I really like the artwork in this game. It's beautiful artwork. And the board, the way you move around, it's really well planned. And we have played this with my friends and we actually just managed to beat the beast on the last move. So that was it for me this, uh, this month, people. Be sure to check this out. Like I said, there will be a Kickstarter in September. They have a website with a lot more info. I just wanted to share this game with you to show it up because I think that this one could be quite, quite big. Hey everybody, Tom here from Buried Board Games. What have I been playing this month? Dinner in Paris. This is a family weight strategy game for two to four players designed by Funny Fox. It's distributed in the UK by Hatchet, who uh, I met those guys at UK Games Expo and I was able to see quite a lot of their catalogue and they've got some really interesting titles. So definitely somebody to look out for in the future. But today we're looking at Dinner in Paris. So join me as we take off the box lid and see what's inside. So first things first we've got this ugh, Parisian Plaza. The other players are going to be rival restauranteurs trying to build up businesses around this plaza and terraces that sort of sprawl out of them. You start the game with a hand of four ingredient cards and your turn starts with you drawing one from this public flop. Then you take two actions. One of them could be to take another card, or you can spend cards to claim a restaurant. In this example, potatoes, tomatoes, cheese and chops gets you a grill. The grill's income provides two coins per round. Once you've built it, you can place it anywhere on the outer edge of the plaza. Here looks good, so now just a finishing touch, a roof. Another option is I can now spend my income to build terraces leading out of that restaurant. I'll build from the left hand side paying the cost above and I'll earn the points below. When you place terraces you're going to situate them outside of your restaurant leading out into the plaza. If you cover up any pigeon cards, woohoo, you get a pigeon card. Pigeon cards offer either an anytime bonus or an immediate bonus you get to activate straight away. There's also a series of both secret and public objectives that you're trying to complete before the end of the game in order to score points. 
If you've got some in your hand and you haven't completed them by the end, you lose points. You're going to get dealt to, you're going to pick one to keep, and the other becomes public property for anyone to claim during the game. Now these public gold cards come in two different types. One might be to try and arrange your terraces in the pattern shown, like this or like this, for example. Meanwhile, others might try to have you surround your terraces around items on the board or have them in particular sections of the grid. Much like in Ticket to Ride, when you've got your private tickets in that, you score points. If you have completed the objectives, if you haven't completed them by the end of the game, you lose those points. So there's definitely a sense of urgency. So initial thoughts on Dinner in Paris. Um, my gut impression was that this would remind me of Ticket to Ride and I was correct. Um, there's many features here that I think run parallel to Alan R. Moon's classic, but I think there's definitely enough differences to um, allow you to own both in your collection. Both have private goal cards that you're trying to achieve and this involves an, er an element of racing against other players to complete these objectives. Um, and there's elements of area control I suppose when you place your terraces down. A core part of the game involves you drafting a card from a public flop using hand management to then spend those ingredient cards to then buy various um, restaurants. Of course, this is the replacement for an actual rail route in Ticket to Ride, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah, but there are plenty of differences that make it stand apart from Ticket to Ride. This board um, is really, really interesting in that you can chase different types of terraces that, of course, cost different amounts but provide you with different points. And, of course, uh, depending on when you hit certain thresholds, that's going to increase your income, which means you can then buy more terraces. Terraces are definitely a major part of this game. Um, something that I found really interesting when I played this as a four-player game, and I was the fourth player in turn order, I was uh, late to the game in building those expensive restaurants and therefore wasn't able to physically buy any expensive terraces that could lead out of those restaurants and I struggled to keep up in that regard. So my strategy in that game was to try and complete as many public objectives as possible. I managed to get a respectable score but I wasn't able to compete really with the players that went for those big restaurants so I'd be keen to see if that was a strategy that you really can't afford to fall behind on. But other, other than that I've really really enjoyed Dinner in Paris. Um, I think it's I'd call it a Gateway Plus game, a kind of step up from the base game of Ticket to Ride at least. Um, and yeah, just absolutely gorgeous table presence. I love these components. I must admit having to stick these stickers on here though was a little bit stressful. Um, I actually got a spare pack of stickers here, you can see. This is how they started and having to stick them on here um, <laughs> was quite a uh, an element of precision, but I managed to get it done. Uh, but I'm really pleased with the, the final results. I think they look really cool. And if I were a painter, I'd definitely consider giving these a lick of paint. And I think they'd look even more amazing when sat there on your table. So that was Dinner in Paris. Hi everyone, my name is Dave Luza from twitch.tv slash Palooza. Today I'm talking about a game that is new to me in August 2021 and it's called Cascadia. Uh, Cascadia is a puzzly tile laying game where you can uh, draft tiles and, and try to score the most points. Let me give you an idea of how the game plays. Here it is, every player starts with their own starting tile. You can play with up to four people and there is a solo mode, and when it is your turn, you just do one simple thing. Pick from what is on display, pick one tile, and you also get the animal token that is connected to it. So, for example, I can take these two. You puzzle the tile onto what is already there, try to connect the different land types to types that are already there because the bigger the area gets, the more points you get at the end of the game. And then you place the animal type, of course, only on an area that has that token uh, depicted on it because the animal needs uh, certain area types, that makes sense. Then you refresh the board so the next player can go. 
There's this beautiful bag with animal tokens. There we go. And your hand fits in. I. <laughs> It's not always the case. And then the next player takes their turn. Every player continues until you have 20 tiles added to your environment. And then you score points for biggest areas of the same type, competing with other players. How big is your forest? How big is your wetlands? And you get more points if you look at the scorecards. The game comes with loads of different scorecards, but you only play with five during a game. Uh, for example, um, um, elks like to be in straight lines, foxes like to be a different uh, other, next to different other uh, species, hawks like to be alone, uh, bears in pairs, uh, different ways of scoring, uh, loads of replayability. It's a lovely game for people who are not into playing a lot of games because it's easy to understand and fast. Uh, also, it's a lovely game for players like me who play a lot of different games. It's very fulfilling to slowly expand, not attack, not destroy. I really enjoy it. Flat Out Games did a great job with this game. Cascadia, go check it out. Also, come join us on twitch.tv slash loserpalooza when you have time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Loserpalooza, well, everybody knows your game. And well, that about wraps us up. Some phenomenal games. I know I've added a couple to my wish list already after seeing them today. Some even I hadn't heard of. So hopefully some new ones uh, that you've not heard of. If you want to get involved with future videos of this, the link to the Discord channel will be in the description box below. Swing by, say hi, hello, join in the chats. And if you want, message me and I'll get you added to the sort of secret group to get involved with the shows moving forward. In terms of all the creators involved today, thank you very much for participating. All their information will be in the description box below uh, with the timestamps and stuff like that. Make sure you go and check out their channels, their socials, everything, because they put out a lot of awesome content. And well, until next time, have a brilliant month's gaming, and I'm Oliver East, signing out.